Picture a drop of water falling through space. Maybe it's a raindrop. That drop comes down, it hits the thin film of water, and it brought up that crown, that splash that you saw. And after a little bit, that thin film of water has become a deep pool. We go into a deep pool, it's different. We still get a crown, but it's not as tall. And furthermore, the incoming drop dimples down the surface of the water, and water does not like being dimpled down. And instead, with surface tension, it flings up the jet, this big, thick jet of water, which will come to a peak, and then it'll fall back down and collapse into the pool. And if I look at that, I go, that looks just like a drop of water going into a basin. And so we get another crown, smaller than before, and another dimple. And then we'll get another jet coming up, thinner and faster this time. And that jet breaks up into more drops that'll fall back down. And the cycle will repeat itself. So one raindrop here makes many different splashes. And we've seen different behaviors, even though the incoming drops are basically the same every time. Right? If, we, if there were no water on the surface, the drop fragments. If there's the thin film, we get that beautiful crown. If the deep basin, we get the jet coming up. And this has been going on the planet ever since the very first rainfall. Throughout the entire history of the human race, these jets and crowns and splashes have been happening before our very eyes, and we have been oblivious. We have not known this is happening. We had no idea this was going on until the late 1800s, <clears throat> when a fellow named Arthur Worthington took these photos of splashes. He didn't use the state-of-the-art 8,000 frame a second high-speed video camera that I had for the videos I showed you. Rather, he was using a film camera, a strobe, and some simple electronics to synchronize the strobe so that on the first drop, the strobe flashed to show the drop about to hit. And then the second drop, the, uh, the strobe flashed a little later to show the process further along, and on and on and on. And what you're seeing there are nine different photos of nine different drops with the strobe going off at different times. And I'm here today to tell you that you can take these photos. Actually, you can take better photos than Worthington took because we have better cameras than he had, we have far better strobes than he had, and we have far, far, far better electronics than he had in the late 1800s. And let me show you what you need. You need a camera like that. This one, uh, the important thing about the camera is that it gives you full manual control. And what I mean by that is you can open and close the shutter when you want, you can control exactly where it's focused, and you can control the iris, the aperture. You'll need a strobe. That's a, a Vivitar strobe, the Model 283, which is a standard strobe for these sorts of high-speed work. You get it on eBay for 20 or 30 bucks. And here's how you set it up. We have the camera up there looking at the place the splash is going to happen. We have the strobe set up to throw its light where the splash is going to happen. And then we have the eyedropper to give us the drop. And the way we do this is we set everything up, we focus the camera, and then we turn the lights out and the room goes dark. And in the dark, we open the shutter of the camera, but there's no image because the room is dark. We release the drop and at the right moment, the strobe fires, the room goes dark again, and now we can close the shutter of the camera, turn on the lights, and see what we got. And you're looking at me going, okay, Jim, how do you get the strobe to go off at the right time? And that is, in fact, the magic. And you need a little bit of electronics. You can buy these as kits, or here it's parts from Radio Shack put together by ourselves. Um, and now I'm going to show you an animation, and I want you to see the connection between the real objects and the animation. So you've got the camera there on the left, and you see my symbol for the camera. On the right is the strobe. And then I've got a rock that I drop the water on. But you might not use a rock. You might prefer to drop onto a leaf or a twig, or the edge of a coin. And whatever you pick, we'll call that the substrate. And here are the electronics, and I mark that as the delay timer there. And here's the setup. Camera, substrate, strobe. Delay timer is ready to fire the strobe. Drop is ready to go. We need a way to tell the delay timer when to start its countdown. And we're going to use an LED for that. 
and the LED shines on a photodetector. The photodetector gives an electrical signal when it does or doesn't see the light. And right now it's saying, I'm seeing the LED light. So it tells the delay timer, wait, wait, wait. And we drop the drop. And when the drop breaks the LED beam, that starts the countdown timer. Now the drop doesn't hang in space like it is in the animation. It's still falling. The timer counts down. We get to zero, flash. We've got the image, close the shutter, turn on the lights. Now, I said we'd have it in the dark, and you may be wondering, what about that LED? Isn't that going to make light in the dark room? And the answer is, yeah, it'll probably do that. But what we can do with the LED is we make sure it doesn't point to where the splash is happening. And then the camera doesn't see it. And you can look at things that aren't just splashes. You can take a water balloon, and if you drop it from not too high, it bounces on the table. And if you do that, there's a whole series of photos of what that water balloon looks like. It does all kinds of things you never expected. I love the one at the top right where the ripples are coming up the edge of the balloon while the center's coming down. It actually flattens out there for a minute. Sometimes the middle bottoms out on the table, and then it comes bouncing back off. That, by the way, is not 15 photos of one drop. That's 15 photos from 15 different times we drop the water balloon. You only get one picture per iteration. But because you can change the delay, you can pick exactly when it happens. You don't have to use that optical trigger that I described. We can use a microphone instead. When a sound comes in, the strobe goes off, or the, after a delay, the strobe goes off. And here's something that makes a loud sound. There's a balloon. I understand it goes kaboom, or this one did. And in the gentleman's hand, where you don't see it, is a microphone. And the sound of the pop has just hit the microphone. We see that when you pop the balloon with a needle, it tears vertically, and the edges start peeling back. But right now, the edges haven't had much time to peel back. That back part of the balloon, it has no idea it's been popped yet. <laughs> now, give it another thousandth of a second. It will find out. And then you have the bit of rubber flying away. And let me convince you of that. What we'll do now is we'll take that photo again with a different person, and we'll do a little more delay, and we'll see it a little later. And that's half a balloon. You've now seen what half of a balloon looks like. <laughs> we can do other things as well. Well, there's that drop of water. There's the crater and the crown. The jet comes up. But we've released a second drop of water behind the first. And now the jet comes up, and a second drop is coming down. It's pretty cool. <laughs> you can pick the delay time you want. And you can pick out any moment you wish of the jet coming up, the drop coming down, the collisional surface forming, spreading out, breaking apart, the ripples. It's up to you. You have the control. And you can go and you can take photos like this one if you like. And I say, any of you can do this. And I'm sure the grown-ups are going, OK, yeah, I could probably do that. High school students, you're probably going, yeah, yeah, I could probably do that. Middle school students, I can imagine my seventh grader going, yeah, I can do that. How about the elementary kids? You feeling like you could do that? Uh -uh. Is that? That's your precise word, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get the feeling. I do. OK, you might need a little help from the grown-ups on the setup, but I know you can do it. And let me show you how I know that elementary school kids can do these photos. I want you to meet Ashley Lenore. She lives in Kentucky. And this photo was taken when she was in fifth grade. And she, as you can tell, was very happy. <laughs> and she was happy because she's got first prize at a competition run by an organization she's part of. And the first prize is for that photo she's holding. And let's look at that photo. All right? It's a collision. We see that collisional surface there. We see the jet has come up. We've had the collision. There's some interesting red going on. And I don't know if she put red food coloring in the water that came in, or maybe she's got a strobe with a red filter over it to give some red light. I don't know. We'll have to play to find out. But the really striking thing about this image is that you can see the logo of the National Beta Club, which sponsored the competition. And what she had done, she'd printed it out actually backwards, mirror image, and she set it up here. And the basin was right there. And the camera is taking a picture not of the logo on a piece of paper, but of its reflection in the surface of the water. And that is so cool. And I have never done this. 
but I'm inspired. She did this? I can do this. <laughs> and so can you. Thank you.